All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Forest Pest Hunters Surveying for Beach Leaf Disease. My name is Sean Kittle. I'm the Communications Coordinator with the Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program. Uh, next slide, please, Becca. All right. Today, we're going to talk about beach leaf disease. I'm going to do just a brief introduction, let you know who the speakers are, and then we're going to get right into uh, beach leaf disease history, identification, and research that's been done. Uh, after that, we do have room for a little Q&A, and then we're going to jump into surveying for beach leaf disease. And after that, we'll talk about talking, or <laughs> we'll talk about adopting a trail, and then we're going to do a really good overview of using IMAP invasives, and then we'll have another Q&A. So if you could all hold your questions until the Q&A sections, it would be uh, greatly appreciated. If you want or you don't want to forget your question, you're welcome to put it in chat. I will be copying and pasting them into a document, so I'll keep track of that and make sure that your questions are asked uh, during the Q&A section, or you can just wait and ask the question yourself if that's what you prefer. And I should also mention that um, the Society of American Foresters has approved one and a half hours of Category 1 continuing forestry education credits for this. So if you're seeking those credits, uh, please enter the following information in the chat at the end of the um, webinar. We'll ask for your name, your email, and your forester license number. And I'll remind you of that at the end, but uh, you have to do that at the end of the webinar. All right, next, please. All right, and today's speakers, we have Maria Moskali. She's with the Department of Environmental Conservation. She's their forest health specialist, and there's her email. Uh, then we have Brineka, Becca Brunhacki with the Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program. Uh, she's our terrestrial invasive species coordinator, and there's her email. And then lastly, we will have Mitch O'Neill. He's going to be going over IMAP Invasive, and he's with the New York Natural Heritage Program on the IMAP Invasives project team. So, all right. And take it away, Maria. You're muted, Maria. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Maria Moskali here from DC Forest Health, and I'm going to give you a brief history of beech leaf disease in New York, go over some of the research, and show you how to identify it and its lookalikes. Next. The importance of American beech. American beech trees are an important component of the northern hardwood forest type, which makes up more than half of the forested land in New York. Wildlife such as black bears, squirrels, mice, turkeys, and many others rely on beech nuts as a main source of energy due to their high protein and fat content. Predators such as owls, coyotes, and others are also in fact affected by beech mass indirectly when their small mammal food source decreases. Beech trees in New York have been in decline from beech bark disease since the 1960s, and now beech leaf disease is the latest threat. It can kill mature trees in six to 10 years and younger trees in just a few years. Loss of beech would cause changes in forest structure that would affect the entire ecosystem. Next. Unfortunately, the forecast does not look good for beech trees in North America. Beech leaf disease is spreading rapidly, as you can see in this map here. Um, in North America, beech leaf disease was first found in Ohio in 2012. It has been observed spreading outward since then. In New York, beech leaf disease has been found on American beech, European beech, and Oriental beech. Symptoms progressed quickly over the years, and there is still much unknown. We have observed stands progress from light symptoms to heavy symptoms in just one year. Mortality of understory trees has been found in two to five years, and mature trees can die in seven years. Next. In New York, DEC Forest Health first started hearing reports of striping on leaves and thinning beech canopies in 2017. We, we first started tracking it as beech leaf disease in 2018. At that time, the only detections were in the most southwestern part of the state. Each year since, we've seen a significant expansion of the disease range. So far this year, we have found beech leaf disease in 15 new counties. Next. Since beech leaf disease has only recently been recognized, its biology and vectors are not well understood. There is still much unknown and research is ongoing. Research by CARTA found that the foliar nematode Litolancus crinadii mechanii causes beech leaf disease symptoms, but it is unknown whether the nematode is the sole cause of the damage or if it is an association with another pathogen such as 
a fungus or a bacteria or a virus. Ewing et al. released a paper in 2021, the foliar microbiome suggests fungal and bacterial agents may be involved in beech leaf disease pathosystem. Their findings suggest that the nematode might not fully be responsible for beech leaf disease and that other microbes might be contributing. The cause of its spread is also unknown. Birds or human spread are two theories. The first time BLD is found in a new county, we send beech leaf samples to the Cornell Plant Disease Diagnostic Clinic to, um, to confirm whether nematodes are present. After that, we confirm new locations with photos of leaf symptoms. Next. For the annual BLD visual survey, beech trees are examined for symptoms of beech leaf disease and tallied as positive or negative. S severity of symptoms is then ranked. All of the positive and negative survey results from 2022 can be seen here in this map. We also get a lot of IMAP submissions, the vast majority from downstate New York, as well as a bunch from Western New York. The final survey map for 2022 will also contain the IMAP data. Next. Tracking local spread of BLD. So DEC Forest Health is working on a small study to track the local spread of beech leaf disease in the forest. The study takes place in Cortland County at Kennedy State Forest. The BLD infestation was initially found in 2020 in a stand with scattered mature American beech. In 2020 and 2021, BLD symptomatic trees were identified and flagged and a perimeter was mapped out around the area of infestation. In one year, the area of infestation expanded from about an acre with 190 symptomatic trees to an area of about four and a half acres with 940 symptomatic trees. So the initial, the initial um, infest, mapped infestation is not marked on here, but it's just a very small amount in the middle here. And then this middle, this middle perimeter is last year. And then this year, the area of infestation expanded to 15 acres. Um, so it went from one acre to four and a half acres to 15 acres. And in addition, it's made all, if you see these red, these red dots, it's made all these jumps this year, um, about a mile, a mile and a half away. Um, and these uh, per, like uh, perimeter, um, jumps. They're like a tree, a couple of trees. Um, I think the largest spot has about 35 trees. And we did survey all these areas each year. So, um, so there, this is a very small study and there are many, many variables to take into consideration as well as many factors still unknown about beech leaf disease itself, including how it spreads. Um, now, most of the symptomatic trees here are small understory beech and beech re regeneration. Um, beech leaf disease affects the lower canopy and understory first, so this is the sort of forest it would move through quickly. So if you did this study in different types of forest, I'm sure that it would move differently, but this is just our one small study um, showing how it moved through this forest. Um, so it makes me wonder when we only find like a couple of trees in one area, if there's just like another larger festering infestation like a mile away that we haven't found. You can go next. A network of monitoring plots was established to assess the symptom progression of beech leaf disease and the change in stand characteristics as the, stand, as the disease progresses. From 2019 to 2022, plots were established across New York using a protocol provided by Cleveland Metro Parks. This is similar to the FIA plot pro protocol that the Forest Service uses. The stands are mixed hardwoods with American beech as a main component. You can go for it. Our 2019 plot data was used in a multi-state analysis showing the extent to which beech leaf disease, beech scale, and beech bark disease are established in the forests surrounding the Great Lakes. Changes in forest structure and composition are expected. The results can be found in this paper, read at all 2022. Unfortunately, if left unmanaged, Invasive species such as buckthorn, honeysuckle, barberry, et cetera, have the potential to fill in the gaps left by the declining beach. Restoration work will have to include invasive species removal. The lower Hudson prism is going to try underplanting in some areas. You can go for it. 
Lingering Beach. Ohio is in the early stages of a multi-year process of identifying potential BLD resistance. They are targeting trees that still have full canopies and relatively few symptoms as potentially resistant trees. They've identified several candidate trees around Northeast Ohio and are working with the Holden Forest and Gardens and David Burke to collect and graph sky on from candidate trees this winter and spring. This is something we would like to start working on in New York. Potential BLD resistant trees would survive while the surrounding trees do not survive. Ideal candidates would be disease free, but it's more likely we would get, they would get beech leaf disease, they just wouldn't die from it. Um, so everyone, and we've only recently discovered like beech leaf disease up in the APIF area, but I want everyone everywhere to just be on the lookout. Like if you, are in an area where there is like a lot of beech leaf disease and you are seeing trees that look like it, they are doing better. That's something that we want to keep track of um, as the disease progresses, the trees that are doing better, they're the ones that might have potential resistance. And that's kind of the stage that we're at right now, just to keep track of anything that we might see. You can go for it. Um, so, so far there are encouraging, some encouraging preliminary results from this study. Beech saplings were treated with polyphosphate 30 by soil drench twice a year for five years. Treated trees are much healthier than the untreated trees. They have fuller canopies, more asymptomatic leaves, fewer symptomatic leaves, and five times fewer nematodes. They expanded the study to mature trees last year and will likely not have results for several years. But they did find that the polyphosphate treated trees maintain around 70% canopy cover compared to only 20% in the control. No difference in mild or heavy symptoms between the treated and control. Um, and while it seems like the polyphosphate treatment is having a positive effect on maintaining canopy cover and a higher proportion of asymptomatic leaves, they still get beech leaf disease and they do still die. And they still have, I mean, they still get beech leaf disease and they still have die back. It is unknown whether severity of BLD symptoms is associated with nematode density, but this study did find a strong correlation showing that to be the case. However, it is still unknown whether there are other microbes associated with nematodes and whether this treatment is actually affecting the unknown microbes. So it's still a lot unknown. You can go for it. So can BLD even be managed with pesticides? This is another thing that's being studied. Um, studies are being done on the effectiveness of pesticides as a treatment of BLD. Currently, emamectin benzoate labeled as mectinite and various strengths of triage are approved for use to treat BLD in New York State, but they may or may not be a waste of money. They have found that various strengths of emamectin benzoate reduce the amount of nematodes in the tree. The treatments did not reduce disease severity, although the trees did not get more disease. And again, it has not been proven that a reduction in nematodes will result in less beech leaf disease. More studies need to be done on effectiveness, as well as timing of application and dilution of the product to help with absorption. You can go for it. Okay, so now I will be going over what you need to know to survey. You can go forward. The ideal survey time is late May through October. Here you can see the banding at leaf out and again in the fall. You can go forward. Go forward. Can you go forward? Thank you. Okay. The importance of pictures, this is the important part. I need good, clear photos of the banding in order to confirm reports. Neither of these photos show me clear evidence of BLD and I would have to mark insufficient to confirm. Photos should be taken upward through the light showing the banding. Also, please only submit one point per area. We don't need individual trees submitted. If you're walking down a long trail and end up far from where you started, maybe you could submit a point at the beginning and the end, but overall one point per area is sufficient. You can go forward. Okay. 
Identifying beech. Okay, so the first thing you'll need to know is how to identify beech trees. Beech trees naturally have smooth gray bark, though they often have beech bark disease, which makes the bark bumpy. And in public areas, they're often carved in two. You go far. Beech leaves are simple and ovate in shape and have teeth. You can see here how every vein ends in a tooth. The leaves are not hairy or sandpapery. Um, here you can see a comparison between Eastern hop hornbeam and American beech. You can see how on the Eastern hop hornbeam, each vein does not end in a tooth. There are many more teeth. You can go forward. So symptoms of BLD generally progress from the bottom of the canopy upward, but can be found randomly throughout. Likewise, it is found in the understory before the overstory. Early symptoms include the darkened striping between the leaf veins. Later, heavy banding can cover most of the leaf surface. This will impact the tree's ability to photosynthesize. After a few years of being infested, leaves will become deformed, chlorotic, and have a thickened leathery texture. BLD symptoms are variable, so I'm now going to show you several more examples of symptoms as well as other beach problems that you might encounter. Here you can see some examples of light to moderate banding. The dark striping on the leaves is most visible looking upward through the light. You can go forward. Here are a few more good clear photos of the dark banding. You can go forward. So why hold, photo why hold leaves up to the light? Here is a good example of why you need to hold the leaves up to the light. You can go forward. Um, these are the same leaves, the first photo taken looking down, and you can see how it's unclear whether beech leaf disease is present. Then the same leaves sh shown up through the light and the dark banding is clearly visible. Okay. Okay. Um, so here I can just show you this. These are the sort of pictures that we would get submitted. This is like spotting the early infestation. Yeah, you can go for it again. And this will... Yeah, see, sometimes like you have to look really carefully. And sometimes you can't tell, are the leaves just overlapping? But then you can like cl look closer and see that there's actually the dark banding up there. You can go for it. Okay, now for heavy symptoms, have heavily infested leaves are shrunken, curled, and leathery in texture. You can go for it. Symptoms progress to puckering, curling, chlorosis, and necrosis. At the latest stages, leaves will be go back one more. At the latest stages, leaves will be deformed, leathery, and possibly shrunken. Now you can go for it. Okay, so other beach problems. Now I'm gonna go over some other problems that you might encounter on beach, including aeroneum patches, aphid damage, and anthracnose. Symptoms are also very variable on these issues and can look very similar to BLD in some cases. Remember, it is always better to report even when unsure and make sure to get good, clear photos. You go for it. So the first look like that might be confused with BLD is the aeroneum patch caused by areophyid mites. This is very common. You're very likely to see this. It is similar to BLD in that the damage is a gall, which is the tree's response to the organism. You can go for it. For the aeroneum patch, there will be a felt-like area on the surface of the leaf, and there might be some puckering on the other side. Most of the time I see light spotting like this. But in more severe cases, there can be some striping like this. Um, yeah, down here, striping. Uh, BLD doesn't have that felt like patch and the thickened area takes up the entirety between the veins. You can go for it. The next lookalike is aphid damage. This is also very common. You are very, very likely to see this. Aphids will cause a lighter banding versus the dark banding on beech leaf disease. Go for it. 
Um, you can see here how the aphid curls are a much tighter curl than the beech leaf disease, whereas BLD curls are an overall distortion of the whole leaf curling. So this is a tight curl, and this is kind of like the whole leaf curling. Also, if you look closely at the back of an aphid damaged leaf, you might see old aphid casings. You can see in this last photo how BL, how you can see in this last photo of BLD how difficult it can be to identify from the top down. The chlorosis could be confused with the aphid stipling. The final lookalike we're gonna go over today is anthracnose, which on beach looks like patches of necrotic tissue, usually at the end, usually on the end at the tip, but it could be towards the side. And here is anthracnose versus, versus beech leaf disease. BLD necrotic tissue can be on areas along the side or striping. You can go more. Management and prevention. So treatments are being researched, but unfortunately nothing has been proven effective at stopping BLD yet. DEC Forest Health staff are cleaning their boots with a boot brush and a 10% bleach solution in, in, in an attempt to prevent spread. Um, this, so when we're going in between beach stands, especially if we are, if we find ourselves in an infested stand, we will clean it with a, a boot brush and then spray bleach on the boots afterwards. And it's important when you are using a bleach solution to add new bleach each day, like every 24 hours it degrades. So I just mix a very tiny little amount to use for that day. And then each day that I'm using, I just add like a tiny amount more. Um, okay, you can go forward. So that's it. Here are the sources I've cited and taken photos from. For more information, please visit the BLD webpage at this link, or you can Google NYSDEC BLD, and this is the first thing that comes up. We keep this as updated as we can. You can go forward. There is a BLD flyer available on this website as well. So this is a really good uh, outreach material that you can give out. Can go forward. So if you have any questions about tree problems, you can contact DEC Forest Health Information Line. Any questions? Uh, Maria, we do have a question in the chat that came in earlier. It mm -hmm. is, what are the invasive plants that could replace declining beech? Anything that's already in the area. Um, you know, the any any invasive problem, any invasive species that you're already having issues with, buckthorn, any of those. The the problem is is the the when the beech die they're gonna there's gonna be gaps in the forest and invasive species tend to like the light like a lot of tree species that would want to grow up are gonna be out competed by these like light loving invasive species. It looks like we have another one in the chat. Is surveying for BLD being included in FIA plots? I don't know. I not that I know of. Um, I don't know that that's necessarily been added. But um, we have our own separate uh, beech leaf disease plots, as do the other states. We're all part of the. We're all doing the same plots. But I don't know that it has necessarily been added to the FIA plots that are already done. All right, does anyone have any other questions? I have a question of, this is Tamara. Hey Maria, we often get a lot of questions from landowners and others who would like to be able to take proactive action. So if someone particularly has ornamental beech trees or a smaller piece of property where a soil drench is possible, 
Um, is that polyphosphate 30 something that DEC is currently recommending to landowners? Um, I did a little quick search as you were talking. It looks like it's more of a growth stimulant. So um, any thoughts you have on, on recommending to landowners that who want to save a few beaches to go with the polyphosphate? Um, it's hard to say what we are recommending because these are still, I just wanted to be known that these are still experimental treatments and that nothing has been proven yet and the experiment is not complete. The experiments were done on small saplings and the, the study has only recently been extended to mature trees. I think that it is something that people could try if they wanted to, but they have to do it as carefully as possible and make sure that they are doing, they're doing the applications at a time that the tree is taking up the most. So do it, so make sure that the timing is appropriate so that the tree is taking up most of the product and that there's not runoff and that it's not in an area where it could run off into aquatic systems where it could cause toxicity. Um, so I think that, it's something that could be tried responsibly, but to just um, just to remind everyone that it is still an experimental treatment. The same thing with the pesticides, it's something that you could try, um, but it is an experimental treatment and to keep that in mind um, and, and do it as responsibly as possible. And then just in general to just try to keep your trees as healthy as possible. So if we've been having drought to like give them water and, you know, prune dead branches and those sort of things. Um, but unfortunately it's, it's hard to like really recommend something when nothing has been proven yet. And Justin agrees, which is good. Any last um, questions? For I do see that there is a comment from Robert Som Somers that says, in my area, Washington County, hay scented fern is an invasive that expands rapidly in open areas in full sunlight. It prevents germination of desirable tree species. Exactly, that is a great example. Should we move on to the next section then? Okay, thanks everyone. Thanks so much, thank, Maria. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. So my name is Becca Bernacki, folks. I'm sure a lot of you have seen me on these webinars before. I'm the Terrestrial Invasive Species Project Coordinator for the Adirondack Park and Invasive Plant Program. And now that Maria's given us this wonderful primer on what we're looking for when we're out looking for beech leaf disease, let's talk a little bit about how we can go about doing those surveys. So the first thing we want to do before going on any hike or any field work is to be prepared. So before hitting the trail, first thing we want to do is review the beech leaf disease survey protocol. And this protocol is something that's going to be emailed to everyone um, after the webinar. As Sean said, we're recording this as soon as that recording is available. I'm going to put it in an email and send it out to everyone. I'm also going to talk about a survey map where folks can sign up for trials and the beech leaves leaf disease protocol will be linked there as well. And it will also be available on APIP's website. If you have trouble finding it at any time, please feel free to reach out to myself or Sean and we'd be happy to email you a copy. And I bring this up because it's really important to review that protocol. That protocol tells us how we're going to survey for beech leaf disease, which I'm going to go over in a minute. It also has pictures of what beech look like because it's really important to be able to identify beech trees as we go through these surveys. It also has pictures of some beech leaf disease so we can know what we're looking for. And at the end of that protocol, as an appendix, are a bunch of pictures of these lookalikes that Maria talked about. So if we're in the field, we're having problems remembering what Maria said, it's always nice to have those pictures to flip through and look at. So we encourage folks to either print this guide and bring a copy in their backpack, or you can download it to your phone for offline use so you can view it in the field. Building on that a bit more, it's always really important to know what we're looking for before we go out. You folks are doing a great job by attending today's webinar. 
But if you're not familiar with these species, it's always good to spend a few minutes online just looking at some pictures, refreshing yourself before you head out. As Maria mentioned, we're encouraging folks to record their findings in IMAP invasives. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with IMAP, Mitch O'Neill is on the call from IMAP, and after I'm done talking today, Mitch is going to provide a great primer on IMAP. And if you have the IMAP Invasives app on your phone, you can take pictures and submit them. And folks like Maria will get those pictures, she'll get an alert, and she'll jump on and be able to confirm whether or not that's beech leaf disease. The last thing we want to do before hitting the trail is if we are going to sign up for a trail, we want to review the directions to the trailhead, make sure the roads to get there are accessible at the, this time of year. We want to review the trail. You folks know as well as I do, sometimes we get to a trail and there's lots of trails branching off. We kind of want to have a plan of attack so we know where we're heading. And as always, before heading outdoors, we want to check the weather, trail conditions, and also our sunrise and sunset times. When we go out in the field, there are a lot of tools of the trade we want to take into consideration. Anytime we're heading outside, we want to wear sturdy shoes and weather appropriate clothing. As we mentioned, we're asking folks to record data at IMAP Invasive, so we want to make sure we take our GPS enabled smartphone with us um, with IMAP Invasives on that. And we also want to take a copy of that protocol I talked about. Anytime we're hitting the trail, it's really important to take the 10 essentials with us to be safe. So those 10 essentials include a navigation. We can't always define, uh, depend on our cell phones. We want to bring a map and a compass and know how to use them. We want to bring some sun protection, so sunglasses, uh, sunscreen. Always bring an extra layer of clothes in case it gets cold or you get wet. Things happen. Sometimes we're out there later than expected, so we want to have a source of illumination, such as a headlight or headlamp or flashlight. I combine those two words there for us. And we all know things can go wrong. So we want to have first aid supply, a way to start a fire, a small repair kit with some tools in it. We always want to have some extra food and water with us. And last but not least, just a small emergency shelter in case the worst were to happen. So we're prepared, we head out and we get to the trail. We're getting out of our, our car at the trailhead. What's next? So it's really important to remember that you are welcome to survey as much or as little of the trail as possible as you wish. So you can survey in your backyard, you can survey in your favorite trail, but we do have a nice sign up map that I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. And the DEC trails on that map were overlaid with uh, beach known beach location locations. So if you survey one of those trails, there's a good chance that there will be a beach down there for you to survey. Um, that being said, you may need to hike a little bit down the trail to find those beach. What's really important, like Maria mentioned, we don't need a million points while you're out there. So what I like to tell folks is if, I, if you're hiking along a trail and you get to your turnaround point and you haven't seen any beach leaf disease, drop a non-detect at that point. Then as you're walking back to your car, you're kind of resurveying the areas you already surveyed just as, at a glance as you walk through. When you get back to the trailhead, drop a point there. So then we kind of have your starting and stopping point. The same thing's true if you come across the stand and it has beach leaf disease and you decide to continue up that trail, just drop another point at your turnaround point, whether it be a detect or a non-detect. So as we start out on our, our hike, we're going to be on the lookout for beach. When we encounter a stand of beach, what we want to do is we want to stop and start searching. So if I'm on the trail, as Maria highlighted, it's really important to look up and look at these trees in the light. We want to look for those darkened stripes between the leaf veins. Again, they're most visible on the underside of the leaves, and they can be seen by looking up into the canopy, or as Maria showed with that great photo, kind of flipping them over and holding them to the light. We can also look for that leathery curled texture. We want to be sure we're not just looking at one tree, though. So we want to kind of step off the trail, walk around a few trees, check them from multiple angles. And when we spend 10 minutes or run out of beach in that area, we can then move on with our hike. Um, we'll have to hike for another 10 minutes, especially in areas where the, the beach are really dense. Um, and after 10 minutes, we'll stop and survey again. If, you know, the beach stands are more sporadic, you're welcome to survey every stand you come to. Again, we do not need points at every stand, just kind of where you start and stop for the day. Those would be perfect. Now, I mentioned detects and not detects, um, and they're both equally important. Um, 
it's great if you go survey your backyard and you know beech leaf disease isn't there, but it's really helpful for us to know that, you know, I went out in my backyard in Jay and I looked and I didn't find it there. And then we know someone did a general search in that area. So please, please, please report those non-detects there equally as important to us. And as Maria talked about, it's really, really important to take quality photos. When you take those observations in IMAP invasives, like I said, Maria is going to get an alert. Other folks at DEC are going to get an alert, and your Prism staff folks are going to get an alert. And we're going to go in, and we want to be able to confirm that based on those pictures. So be wary, and you know, take good pictures. Um, those are really important to us, and we appreciate those. So just some basic tips here. Detection time for the species is anytime beach is in leaf. As Maria showed in her pictures, you know, we can see it from leaf out. And we can also see it after those leaves start to die back for the fall. Our program, our forest pest hunters program is gonna run for about six weeks this year from September 15th till October 31st for beach leaf disease. And for all of you folks, I see a lot of familiar names. We're gonna kick off our forest pest hunters for Hemlock Willi Adelgid again uh, after the holiday season is over. We're going to look for the host tree while we're out there. So the host tree for beech leaf disease is, you guessed it, beech trees. And just as a reminder, beech typically has this really smooth bark that unfortunately folks like to carve up, and that can get rather cankered when it's infested with beech bark disease. Um, and the beech leaves, you can think about going to the beach. They kind of have that wave on the edge. You know, you can think about the waves at the beach as opposed to some of those look like that have more serrated edges, like you know, your steak knife a bit more. We're going to look at the underside of the leaves for that banding. We're also going to look for that leathery texture. What's really important is we're going to look up. Bending is most easily seen by looking up into the canopy and holding the leaves up to the light. So I kind of alluded to the fact that we have this sign up map and we can sign up to survey for beech leaf disease. So as I mentioned, where to survey, we can survey in lands not associated with map. It's great to go out and check your backyard, check your favorite hiking trail, you know, if you're getting out with the family to look at the leaves. But we do have a sign up map if you're unsure where to start. And there are some priority areas on that map if, if you really want to give us a hand. So bear with me for a moment. Here's the link to the Beach Leaf Disease Survey. As I mentioned, we're going to send that in today's follow up email. And when we go to that link, we're going to see this awesome splash page. Everyone can still see that, right? Sean, can I get a thumbs up that we, we're seeing the page? Awesome. So this splash page just has a little bit of information about beech leaf disease. It gives us that reminder that we always want to check the weather and trail conditions before we head out on a trail. It gives us a reminder when the survey season is going to wrap up. And it also uh, can link us to the IMAP Invasives webpage. We can go ahead and click OK. Where I see this awesome map. Before we get into the map, I do want to direct you to these links at the top. So as I mentioned, we do have a beach leaf disease survey protocol. And as we just scroll through this quickly, it tells us what we want to bring with us while we're out on the trail. It's going to tell us how to set up IMAP invasives, which Mitch is going to talk about in just a minute after I'm done here. It's going to walk us through how to use the survey map, which I'm going to talk about as soon as I'm done scrolling through this. And then it tells us what to do. So what I just talked about, what we're looking for, how we search an area for beech leaf disease. It's then going to talk, tell us how we can enter that observation into IMAP invasives while we're in the field. It has pictures of beech trees, so we know what we're looking for, as well as beech leaf disease general considerations for your hike, what those 10 essentials are, links to leave no trace videos, and that sort of thing. And finally, lots of pictures of these lookalikes that Maria talked about so that we can compare them in the field to what we're seeing. There's also a link to take us to the IMAP Invasives website, which has a ton of great resources, as well as APIP's Beach Leaf Disease webpage where you can learn more. So switching gears here, we can look at this map. And we can scroll just by using our scroll wheel on our mouse or by using these plus or minus buttons. So right now we're going to see a whole bunch of orange dots and red dots. So red orange dots are trailheads that are available for survey. Um, red dots are also trails that are available by, for survey, but they're a little bit higher priority because they're closer to that known infestation. 
I'm going to walk you through how to adopt a trail. And when we adopt a trail, these dots will turn green. So if you're looking at the map, you know that the green dots were already accepted by someone, adopted by someone. So I can zoom in on this map. And as I zoom in, we're going to see, start to see trails show up. And each of the trails is color coded. And it's really important that there may be multiple trails in one area. So if I click on this trail, we can see it's a hiking trail. And I can click this over arrow. Well, try that again. And it's also used as a snowmobile trail. So I can zoom to my area. I can say, maybe I'm going to be up in Lake Placid next week. I can use the search bar up here. It'll take me to Lake Placid. Might need to zoom out to see. I go, oh, there's a nice little cluster of trails up here. This might be a fun area to go survey. And I can scroll in. And if I want to change the base map, I can click on these four squares up here and choose different base maps. So I always recommend just looking at the imagery and kind of checking out what the, the road situation is. So I can clearly see there's a road going here and there's a little, a little trailhead. There's maybe even a car park there. And I think maybe that's an area I'm going to want to survey. So I can click on the orange dot. So tell me the name of that trail parking area. What's also cool is if I don't know how to get there or want to see how far it is from my house, I can click on this link right here to view the approximate location on Google Maps. And that will take me to Google Maps. I can type in my address and it'll give me directions. If everything looks good and it's a trail I want to sign up for, I'll click on sign up now. It'll take me to this page. It's automatically going to fill in the site name and the priority. We're going to fill in the registration date, which would be today's date. I type in my full name, my IMAP user, e or my email address, which is also my IMAP uh, username, my IMAP personal ID. If you give me a second, I probably should have looked this up earlier. Sorry, folks, my computer's running slow. So I'm just going to put in ones for right now. Um, but I do encourage you to go find your IMAP user number so that it's linked and we can find you that way. So I'm going to ask us if we've ever previously hunted for, I don't know, excuse me, if we've ever previously participated in APIS Forest Pest Hunters program. So if you worked on the hunt for HWA the last two years, you can hit yes. If you haven't hit no, we're excited to have some new folks this fall. If you have any notes or comments for us, there's a great place to enter them here. So we can say each leaf disease is scary. We're going to click here, and there is a disability and liability waiver. It is very short, so I do encourage you to read that before you click acknowledge and accept. And then we'll hit submit. It's going to give me a confirmation that I have successfully signed up for that site. And when I return to the map, we can now see that one site has been adopted and that dot has turned green. So it's as simple as that. And like I said, the recording of this webinar is going to be available. The survey protocol is linked up here that walks you through that step by step. And of course, you are more than welcome to survey your backyard or your favorite trail. So without further ado, I'm going to bring back up our PowerPoint and I'm going to pass the torch to Mitch. Thanks, Becca. Uh, just give me a second to get control. Cool. I think I'm all set now. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Mitchell O'Neill. I work with the New York Natural Heritage Program with the IMAP Invasives team. Um, and I'm here to talk about IMAP Invasives. Um, so I, I see a lot of familiar names. I think I even see I, at one point, I saw one of our winners from uh, the Hemlock Lily Adelgid mapping challenge that we did back in February. So a lot of you are familiar with IMAP, um, but I'll give a brief overview for those of you who are not. Um, it's wonderful to have both the, the current users and the new users. Um, so IMAP Invasives is the centralized invasive species database to support PRISMs, state agencies, and other partners working on invasive species issues. And in New York, it's administered by the New York Natural Heritage Program, which you can find out more about at nynhp.org. Um, 
And one of my favorite things about IMAP is the users. So it's used by a really diverse group of people. So all the way from state agency people, um, PRISM staff, nonprofit staff, but also the general public and volunteers and students. Um, so anybody can use IMAP and anybody can submit data to IMAP. Um, so some of the features in IMAP that I'll briefly mention are anybody can go in and view species distributions um, and generate reports for species in your area. Um, you can also report invasive species that you find and people can set up early detection alerts as well. And so I'm not going to do a full training today. I'm going to keep it more overview ish. Um, so I'll, I'll walk through briefly how people can set up an IMAP Invasives account or log in if you set one up a while ago but haven't logged in. Um, and also I'll talk a little bit about the mobile app, which can be used to report observations. Okay, so to, to start, yeah, you can go to our website at nyimapinvasives.org. And there's a login button at the top right. And there are also a lot of other resources and information on the website that I encourage people to explore. But to just get to IMAP and create an account or log in, you just go to the login button at the top right. And so that brings you to our login page slash our create account page. If you already have an account, you can enter that information right in and log in. Um, you might have to use the forgot password button if you haven't logged in in a while. And you can always email us if you're having uh, issues getting into your account. Um, but if you don't have an account yet, you can fill out your information in this create account box. Um, so just your name and your email and create a password and select New York for your jurisdiction. Um, and one important step to remember is that uh, once you sign up your sign up for an account, you have an account ready for you, but you can't use it until you activate it. So um, there's a very important step after you click that join button um, to check your email and follow the click here link to activate your account. Um, and sometimes that ends up in your spam or junk folder. So make sure to check there if you don't see it. And again, you can you can email us if you're having issues. Um, but eventually, uh, you should be able to, to log in and you'll be brought to the main map. There's always this pop up about any recent updates. Um, once you've read through that briefly, you can exit out and be on your way to explore IMAP. And so um, if uh, to to submit data and be, be part of this volunteer project, you don't necessarily have to get that deep into IMAP invasives. Um, if this is as far as you want to go, you can stop here. But if you're interested, you can do some more exploration. So there's the main menu. Um, one of the things in there is if you click on your account, it'll bring you to a page where you can see that person ID that Becca was mentioning. Um, there's navigation tools. You can zoom into your area. You can search um, like the name of your town or your address. There's action tools at the top. Um, so you can actually create records um, if you found something and want to report it. And you can filter on the species you're interested in. Um, and then the geographic layers on the right. And so here you can switch base maps and turn on different layers and, and stuff like that. So by default, it's showing you the confirmed presences. But if you want to see other stuff like unconfirmed or not detected, you can turn those on. And uh, I want to make one quick note about joining uh, APIP's Forest Pest project. Um, so this kind of links you to their project so they can go in on the map and look at all the reports from this project and kind of puts your records in with all of the other people working together on this. Um, so you can, I, I sent some, some stuff to Becca to include in that follow up email so you can have a link. Um, so once you once you're logged into IMAP, you can just go to this link, which will be in that email and then you can request to join the project. And so um, I've been kind of talking about the, the online version of IMAP so far. Um, so that's where you can log in and look at all the data and uh, access your account and all that sort of stuff. Um, but it's a website. So if you're out on the trail in Lake Placid, you might not be able to or you might not want to go into your browser and log in and do all of that stuff. 
Um, so we do have mobile a mobile app uh, that's built for uh, sort of that uh, when you're out in the field, don't have internet connection, want to do some quick data collection, uh, presence not detected. The mobile app is configured to do that, and it uses your phone GPS, um, and you don't need to be connected to the internet to use it. And so you can find our app in the App Store if you search IMAP Invasives. And just to give you, rather than going through step-by-step, -step, um, I will show you where you can find step-by-step -step tutorials, but for now I'll just give you the the main workflow. Um, step one is that you download the account and set up your app. So essentially you put in your, your information, so your name, or no, sorry, your, your email, which is your username, your password, and select New York, and then click this retrieve IMAP lists button. Um, and you do that while you're connected to internet. So you could do that after the webinar today. Um, and then once you've clicked that retrieve IMAP list button, you're ready to go. Um, so you could go out onto the trail and use this add observation button to create new records um, where you, you take a photo and select the species and whether it was detected or not. And it saves those all to your phone um, and it uses your phone's GPS to, to capture your location at those observations. Um, and so those will be all on your phone as they show up as these yellow boxes. And so they're all saved to your phone, which means they're not really on the, the database yet. So Maria can't confirm them yet. APIP can't see them yet. So it's a very important last step that once you're done with all your data collection, once you get back home and you have internet connection again, make sure you go in and upload those uh, records by using this upload selected option. So it's like this three-step process. Um, you need internet connection to set it up, but then you're free to go out into the field without internet connection, but you need to upload those records once you are back in connectivity. And I'll, I wanted to make this note um, in here in my, on my slide, I have an example of tree of heaven, but I think we should think back to some of the photos that Maria shared. Um, so good photos are super, super important. Um, so like if you take a, a picture of a beech leaf from the top, um, you can't really tell if it has beech leaf or not. But if you take a really nice focused picture from the bottom with the sun coming through the leaf, um, then it's much easier for Maria to be able to tell whether it's beech leaf disease or something else. Um, you can also put your hand in the photo to help focus and other tricks like that. Um, but good photos are really important. and. I'll, I'll just mention that in the IMAP mobile app, it only lets you do one photo right now, um, but you can always feel free to save a couple more to your phone just in case um, you were contacted, like they needed more information on your record, that kind of thing. And so that's kind of the, the quick version. Um, and so I'll just also add on a couple helpful tips, some things that people commonly run into. So for the online version, my one tip will be to make sure you activate your account. So check your inbox and spam folder. Um, we'll check your inbox first. It'll probably end up there. But if it's not there, then check your spam or junk folder um, after you sign up for an account. And then for the mobile app, my top tips will be um, one, make sure you set your preferences. Uh, so put in your information and click that retrieve IMAP lists button. Um, and one little note, if you if you do that and then you go in and join the, go in online and join the project, um, that project won't show up in your app automatically. You'll have to click that retrieve IMAP list button again to like resync your account. Um, but if you do the online stuff and join the project first, um, when you click retrieve IMAP lists in the app, it'll bring everything in um, all at once. Um, another tip I have is we have a, a species on our list called a fake species. And um, as you can probably tell, it's not a real species. It's just set up so that people can test out the app, make sure it works um, before they go out in the field and do real data collection. So I encourage people to try that out. It's really good to do that before you go out in the field um, so you can kind of troubleshoot in the comfort of your own home. Um, number three, uh, just a, a reiteration that 
it's really important to record those not detected surveys. So if you go out and spend all this time looking for beech leaf disease and you don't see it, please document that because that's really helpful for us to see. And then number four, just a reminder, um, please always remember to upload your records when you get back home. And so that was, like I said, that was the quick version, but we do have more in-depth step-by-step versions if anyone wants to go through it that way. Um, so we have this training page, which has self-guided training materials. Um, you can also email us if you get stuck. And one of the training materials I'll point out is our YouTube tutorials. So we, one of the first things on our YouTube page is a, a four-part tutorial on how to use the mobile app to submit a record. Um, and they're all very short videos, so all together it's less than 10 minutes, but you can watch through and pause when you need to catch up and that sort of stuff. And I'll just mention briefly that there are additional functionalities in IMAP for anyone who's interested in going uh, beyond just reporting, although reporting is super important and we're really happy uh, when anybody reports IMAP invasives. Um, but if you're interested in other stuff, you can set up alerts for species in your area. Um, you can view distributions of species in your area. You can collect advanced data if you're interested. Um, if you're if you're doing invasive species work as part of your job, you can join your job's organization in IMAP. Um, but that's all extra stuff. The most important thing is to uh, report observations to IMAP invasives because we really rely on the huge network of professionals and volunteers um, and everywhere in between all across the state to uh, keep our database up to date. So you guys are all our most important data source. And uh, just some other last notes. Um, you can learn more at our website, nyimapinvasives.org, particularly our training tab. Um, we do a monthly webinar on the last Wednesday of each month at 1 p.m. Uh, next month is about some of the new features in IMAP this year. Um, and other IMAP trainings are occurring across the state if you ever want to come to another one to get refreshed. And of course, there's the self-guided trainings that I just mentioned. And so uh, thank you all for joining and I'll pass it back over. I think one right thing up. I just want to point out quick, sorry, Sean, um, for those of you who were on our Forest Pest Hunters program, we are using the same IMAP project. So you folks are all set and ready to go. You don't need to sign up for a new project. And I'll pass it back to Sean. Hey, everyone. Thanks, uh, Becca and Mitchell and Maria for all your time today. Um, I want Before we get into the q and I just want to give a shout out here to mark your calendars October 19th um, from 9 to 4.30. Uh, we are doing an invasive species at our door, uh, invasive species summit at the Adirondack Experience Museum on Blue Mountain Lake. It's a free all day symposium on hemlock, woolly adelgid, and hydrilla. Uh, yeah, so uh, please register and we hope to see you there. All right, does anyone have any questions? You can move to the next slide. Okay. Oh, yeah, if you're seeking those credits, um, please entering the follow enter the following information into the chat and I will make a note of it. So first and last name, email address, Forrester license number, if you have one, and whether or not you are certified by SAF. And if you're not comfortable putting it out there for everyone to see, you can just send it to me directly via the chat. That'd be fine. So this is Tamara, and I'll uh, start us off with a question for Maria. And I'm just curious, because you're out there in the field, I'd love to get kind of your impressions of what you're seeing. And I've been out looking. I haven't seen anything yet. See a lot of lookalikes. Um, but my friends down in the lower Hudson tell me that once I walk through it and I see it, I'll know it. And that um, their reports are that in some places in the lower Hudson Valley, Westchester County, that pretty much every tree they're finding is infested. So, you know, if you're out in the lower Hudson Valley or in Western New York, tell us what you're seeing, please. Yes, is that a question? <laughs> um, it is too, I, it's like, will you know it when you see it? And yes. how extensive is it in those places that are- Yes, that's, 
that's accurate that because I've been working with the Laura Hudson prism and they've also told me the same thing about Westchester pretty much every beech tree that they see has it unfortunately it's really bad um and yes once you see it especially with that striping like you'll get that search image on and you'll understand what the what the it's the dark striping that you'll notice um but yeah it and it unfortunately and like as i showed like in our in our study like it just rapidly like, just rapidly spreads too. It just is so quick. And also it it seems like it's it's in the trees before they show symptoms too, unfortunately. Like it's always further than what we can see. Um I'm not sure how long yet, but it's definitely in the trees um, before they show symptoms. Um, so it's a little bit further, not sure how much further than the trees that are showing symptoms, unfortunately. Right, please be sure to give me your email if you're looking for those credits. Any other questions, folks? I'm not seeing anything coming on chat. Uh, here's a question. Is there an entity in Connecticut to report beach leaf disease to? I live in NW, Northwest Connecticut, on New York and Massachusetts borders. You're muted, Maria, if you're talking. Thank, thanks. Um, yes, you would want to report that to Bob Mara um, at the Connecticut Agricultural Station. Um, he is the expert over there. Um, let me see if I can find his information. Sorry. Um, maybe I can just Google it real quick. Any other questions while Maria is looking for that email address? Okay. If not, I'm going to put it um, into the chat. Thanks, Maria. Hopefully the, this is just the first thing that came up on Google. Um, here. Let me just check my email and see if there's anything different that I have for him. <laughs> he, he has done a lot of work with this as well. He's very knowledgeable and I would definitely reach out to him in Connecticut. Okay, yeah, that's the same. That's the same email I have in my email as well. Thanks, Maria. I'm sure Larry really appreciates that. So thanks for finding it for us. Last call for those SAF credits. If you didn't get your information in, please do that right now. I guess without further ado, thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. We're so happy to be able to kick off this program. We had such great participation this fall and folks recorded over 400 IMAP observations or last winter for Hemlock Bully Adelgid. So we're really excited to get out in this fall hiking season and search for beach leaf disease. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to email myself or Sean and keep an eye out from me for an email this afternoon. And I'll have that protocol that I showed you folks as well as a recording from the webinar. And a big shout out and thank you to Maria and Mitch for joining us today. And thanks thank so you, much everyone. for putting this together. This was so great. Yes, thank you. We we get a lot of IMAP submissions from downstate, but we don't we I don't I don't remember really seeing any from that Adirondack area or northern New York. So this will be great if we get more. And I love how you categorize all the trails and organized it. That's that's really great. Thank you.
All right. All right, everyone, thanks for joining us today. We'll see you next time. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.